In the last video, here's the link if you haven't seen it, I showed you how I spent months creating Dark Souls and Star Wars themed D&D-ish sessions for me and my friends to enjoy, and how those creative endeavors led me to become an absolute fucking unit at building stuff in Tabletop Simulator. Things I designed include inspired intuitive interfaces, dignified dice rolling devices, crazy kick-ass combat, moronic magic mechanics, piss-poor puzzles, and sinfully stupid stat systems, all with the aid of my awe-inspiring accounting abilities utilizing seriously sexy spreadsheets. You might look at all those things along with the pretty graphics and think, oh my God, those sessions must have been awesome. But no, you dumb diaper baby. Even with all that cool crap, the game still crashed and burned like your butt after a beefy five layer burrito. What do you think I did next? Learned my lesson, quit overcomplicating things and just started playing vanilla 5e Dungeons and Dragons like a normal ass person? No, damn, you're really bad at guessing stuff. What I did is crunk that shit up to 11 and made my own world, my own characters, and my own story, and then made it even more complicated than the last time. Full disclosure, when I first started writing this video, my plan was to display the best possible version of the perfect game I'd created by scripting everything to where nothing could go wrong, and then shoving that into one final video. But that isn't what actually happened. As cool as things might seem on the surface, there was still a metric butt ton of glitches and human frustrations that came along with playing the game itself. And to be frank, I wasn't exactly excited to talk about that. All right, with that out of the way, I can honestly say that what I'm about to tell you is the real story. So buckle up, Buttercup, because we're about to get froggy up in this Okay. In the past several sessions, one of the biggest complaints I've received is that there really isn't a narrative to interact with. And that makes sense because I probably spend 95% of my prep time on making cool gadgets and maybe 5% on the actual plot and NPCs. So as an experiment, I'll flip that ratio on its head by making the narrative the main focus and keeping the technical stuff to a minimum. But what would the story even be about? Well, the samurai toe tattoo I just got is dope as fuck. <laughs> And Sekiro is probably my favorite video game of all time, so maybe I could build a world that is similar to the two. I mean, heck, why not? Move over, Tolkien, you fat hobbit. The world I'm about to create is gonna make Middle Earth look like Tommy Wiseau's The Room. Oh, hi, Mark. Let's do this. Okay, I guess I need some help getting started. But where doth one go to attain such precious enlightenment? Oh, I know! <laughs> I can't, for the life of me, find the original post, but a person on here said to start with the antagonist, decide who their friends and enemies are, and then use that web of connections to inform what else is happening in the world. I really like that idea, but I don't want the villain to be too cut and dry, so I'll be a little Game of Thronesy and give the faction leaders some good and bad qualities to make them more relatable. That being said, here's a brief overview of the world's inhabitants and their current state of affairs. In the vaguely feudal Japan-inspired country of Setajiwa, there are two main factions. The Kagoshi, comprised of the royal family and those that support the claim that they are divinely selected to rule, and anyone that opposes that claim is dishonorable and against the will of God. The Unzari, the mighty yet loyal military fist of Setajiwa that has long carried out the orders given by the Kagoshi, due to fear that opposing the Imperials could separate them from a peaceful afterlife. When we meet these two groups for the first time, we find out that there is growing doubt throughout the country that the royal family is not truly selected by the divine, and that maybe the ruling class are just using that as an excuse to stay in charge. And now that their homeland has come unexpectedly under attack, the citizens of Setajiwa are forced to decide which faction they should support to give them the best chance of survival. Oh, and don't forget the other groups of weirdos hopping around. Creepy ass snow monkeys, highfalutin birds of prey, and no bullshit ninja rabbits can all be found eating grass and kicking ass across the moonlit landscape. Now that we have an idea of what the main conflict looks like, let's spend some time on character design. I think I'll take a page out of the Lord of the Rings extended edition appendices <laughs> and do my best to make the characters I create feel like they're pulled from history rather than a fantasy novel. A couple ways I can keep things rooted is by using period weapons and clothing, or at least as much as Hero Forge will let me, and paint with simple, earthy color palettes when designing all the character models. Also, I like the idea of using well-known character archetypes as a solid base for the NPCs, and then giving each of them specific goals. That way their motivations appear more organic. Like I always found it insanely cool how NPCs in FromSoft games all already had stuff to do, and would sometimes move around without me even needing to engage with them. Whew, this is becoming a lot of stuff to remember. Keep track of everything, why don't I make a wiki and NPC tracker? That way I can access the information quickly and easily. Okay, sweet. Everything's looking good so far. I think it's time for session zero. Ooh, but what if I made a teaser trailer that could help set the mood for the entire game? No, no, that's too much. Don't do that. How did you come to this place?
this land undecided. Was it by your will? Or another's? You may not know it, but the future hinges on your answer. The heavens have been questioned. Death has touched the divine. The race to the peak has begun. Hell yeah, my dude. Session Zero went really well considering all the ideas I introduced. And since I have all the players' backstories early, I can use that information to build encounters that are more tailored to the party as a whole. Speaking of encounters, I think it would be a good idea to organize them into a hex crawl format and literally just fill in the blanks. But let's take the hex crawl idea a step further and build some custom assets in Unity to make the hexes jumbo size and give the map my own stylistic flair. And wouldn't you know it, even after all that, we still have a little extra time to refine and implement some of my other ideas into the game. You know, just a few small things like redesigning the entire user interface, completely reimagining the combat flow, adapting the loot system to work with all the new crafting mechanics, needlessly automating self-sorting inventory chests, mixing and mastering custom sound effects for every in-game action, setting up scripting keys to make spawning dice and accessing character sheets less clunky, making a designated rest area for the players to plan between objectives, building a magical monkey slot machine that spits out rare items when you feed it tokens, and of course, adding in a button that allows the players to croak on command like a frog. It really does feel nice to have kept things simple. Session one is going to be smooth as butter. And it was. For the most part. Functionally, the game worked as intended. Other than the crafting system completely shitting itself. But of course, suffering is to be expected. Looking back, no one really had any complaints. Everyone seemed to enjoy talking to the NPCs. There were a couple cool stealthy combat moments. And the next session was set up nicely by some interesting cliffhangy plot hooks. Yet, something still felt off. Like, am I crazy? Why do I feel so anxious all of a sudden? Everything is literally fine. But everything was not fine. And in the next session, you would find out why. The scene opens with the party all huddled around a campfire as they try to decide what they should do next. In the previous session, two prominent options were introduced by a member of the Kagoshi Royal Guard, Guardian Senji. Option 1. There is a nearby encampment that has been overrun by a scouting force of turtle invaders, the Majuku, who are attempting to light a watchtower so they can signal their forces in the bay that it is safe to come ashore. And option two, a small group of Unzari samurai were overheard discussing their intentions to betray, hunt, and capture a member of the Kagoshi royal family, despite the incoming attack. The party agreed that the most pressing issue was attempting to prevent the impending Majuku invasion. Great, about 15 Zebras thought. This would be a wonderful opportunity for everyone to work together and use their unique skills for the benefit of the group. However, one of the members attempted to murder an innocent civilian on sight. One relentlessly tried to raise up a ronin rabbit. Another gave himself up to the enemy willingly, leaving his group without his help for the remainder of the session. And the rest intentionally lit a barrel full of black powder in a cave, packed to the brim with hundreds more barrels full of black powder, severely injuring or killing everyone nearby, including the party in a single action. The end. And you know what? All of that would have been fine. If not for the feedback I received at the end of the session. Dude, you didn't tell us where to go. Why don't you code in waypoints so we don't get lost? The game's too automated. It doesn't feel like we're playing real D&D. I didn't know lighting all that black powder we were standing right next to would kill us. You really should have said something. Why can't I look for a ridiculously specific item I want to find anywhere on the map at any given time? Like, damn, bro, it's kind of railroady if you don't let me do whatever I want. Your mom is fat and ugly. What the fuck do you mean you want waypoints? You just said the game feels too automated. And wouldn't that take all the fun and challenge out of the game? And no shit, it doesn't feel like real D&D. We have never played real D&D, let alone in just this one session. Furthermore, please tell me of any time in history where igniting a massive amount of explosives in a tiny enclosed space has ever resulted in anything other than instant death. And last and fucking most, no stupid, it's not railroading to tell you no when you ask the same dumb self-centered question every single turn.
I... I need a break. Holy shit, guys. It is seriously blowing my mind how well the last video is doing, especially since it's my first video on YouTube ever. And dude, don't even get me started on TikTok. I literally had never used that app a day in my life because I'm old. And then the first clip I post gets over 20,000 likes. Like no joke, I could not sleep because I was so excited. Seriously, you all are fucking amazing. And I'm just so thankful that you're enjoying the videos at all, let alone getting me all emotional by giving such beautiful compliments in the comment section. Oh yeah, and sorry I didn't completely deliver on part two just yet, I realized while writing the script that it was going to be a lot to squeeze into one video. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one, Zeb bro. Stay froggy.